Welcome to part 10 of the tutorial. In the last part you have seen GUI's excellent web page with a list of all the graphics modes that the Atari graphics system is capable of producing, their resolution, the number of colors which revise between 2 and 16, and the amount of memory they takes, and also examples how they look like. In this tutorial I want to show you how actually you can change these colors, which colors are available. So we copy the part 4, which contains the chip map, just to have a starting point. Okay, so this is how the memory map looks like. So we have the RAM, we're not interested in RAM. We have the cartridge area, also not interesting today. And we have the operating system at the begin and at the end of the address space. Okay, in addition we have some slots. We have the reserved area, we have the module port, we have the, yeah, this should actually be the PIA, the parallel in and out adapter, which we are anyway not interested in. I'll fix this here. PIA. Okay, what's left? We have the PBI, which is also just a, a placeholder for the parallel bus interface of the Atari, so the expansion port. And we are left with uh, three main custom chips. GTIA for everything that creates pixels, colors, brights, and has some input with the, for the console keys. Pokey, which does the rest of the I.O., be it human I.O. or parallel, uh, seri serial I.O. And we have Antic which has the main purpose of feeding GTIA with data and besides that also performs the refresh cycles for DRAM. So we need some more information about these three. So we have an empty program and we do nothing about GTIA. So how can we find out something? Yeah, Woodson IDE comes with a built-in help system that is integrated into Eclipse. It gives you details on the IDE, everything on the usage and how to uh, yeah, configure it. It has the information about the different assemblers. Yeah, we stick for mats, with mats for this tutorial and also different hardware uh, details. So for every hardware you see the icon, default file extension where you can find a proper emulator and for some of them, with the permission of the respective authors, I have also added references to the technical details of the custom chips. Now you can find the same here for C64 also. Okay, so let's look into it. So we again find here Antic, GTIA and Pokey. And today we focus on GTIA. GTIA comes with a total number of 16 addressable registers, which is from D000 to d 1F. Okay, that was nonsense. Of course, there are 32 addressable registers. And in fact, the team that designed GTIA back then was a very clever team, as you know. And they were good hardware designers, meaning they know how to save cost. Saving cost for custom chips means saving every transistor that you don't need. And you have to keep in mind that a transistor in a custom chip is much more expensive than, for example, a transistor in a um, simple array like a DRAM that you can even buy off the shelf. So, the design is about saving every single bit and every single gate. How can you save gates? Yeah, when you look at the address space and you see that we have 16 things that we can read and 16 things that you can write, you can think of uh, putting it in into an address space of 32 registers. Another way to look at it is to think about what information is stored from the CPU to the custom chip and what information is actually retrieved from the, C from the custom chip to the program. And if you separate these two things out, you can save a lot of gates. Why? Well, if you want to make um, some, a register like this, which is the horizontal position of the first sprite, if you want to make it writable, it means you have to put eight transistors into the custom chip to store the value that the CPU writes there. 
if you want to make this value readable again so the CPU can read it back from the same location you have to add additional gates yeah, to put to connect the output of these transistors again back to the bus yeah, and you also have to add some tri-state logic yeah, and it all makes it more complicated so at the same time you can do the you can save registers if you have things that can only be read if you put them at the same address location like some other registers. Why? Because then the address decoder for these in total 64 different functions or, or features in the chip they can work with simply 32 actual registers and address lines. Yeah? So also the address decoder becomes smaller. And this is why in the custom chip documentation you will typically see the same address twice once with a meaning for read access yeah, and here it means it in the different bits indicate collisions between a movable object and the playfield and with a meaning for writing to that okay and in particular it means if you write a value and you read it back the value that you read will normally mean something else yeah there are some exceptions uh, where the same uh, register is used also for read and write, but it is an exceptional case. Okay, so which hardware registers are we interested in in this tutorial? We are interested into the, in the colors. And if we look at the naming, we see at D012, there starts a sequence of registers named cal. Yeah, ignore the read part, just see the right part so there are cal registers and in total there are nine one the first one is called color player missile zero followed by player missile one player missile two player missile three that means the four players and their corresponding missile can have separate colors then we have color play field one uh, zero one two three and the background color yeah this gives a total of nine color registers and that is actually the maximum amount that you can use in a certain graphic mode which is called graphics 10. In all other graphics modes either the graphics are uh, uh, use two of these, four or in graphics 12 and 13 even all five for the playfield and the colors for players and missile are always separate. So color background, this sounds reasonable. So we have D01A. So we define color background and it is D01A. So and let's start the show. So we use a value, let's say 3 and 8 and we store it there and for some reason that you I will explain shortly I loop I jump to the main part again and when we start this we get a light red border um, background in normal graphics modes really means background in high-risk graphics modes like graphics 0 or graphics 8 it means border so let's look at it what did we do yeah we see here the actual bit meaning of the different registers and we see that the uppermost four bits are dedicated to the chroma whereas the lower four bits are dedicated to the luma and here and this is very very sad people at Atari actually saved one two three four five six seven eight nine more transistors because they did not store the lower lowest significant bit of the luma gtia can actually produce 265 colors but when you lose palette mode like this one only three bits are used for the luma and that means you only have eight brightnesses instead of 16 brightnesses technically the chip can do it simply these nine transistors are unfortunately missing Okay, and what I did is I wrote a value that was 3, 8, that means color 3, which is red, and brightness 8, which is medium brightness. Okay, let's change the color. So we start with this color, 
and I say loop and I want to cycle through the colors. So I clear the carry flag, I add one, we store it to the background color and we loop. And I stop the emulator. Yeah, and here you can now actually see that the it's the same color and you see the brightness increasing. Yeah, maybe I add some delay. Yeah, let's put in some 20 knobs to delay the whole loop. So, if I stop now, you can even see it better. Yeah, there's the chroma and the luma is increasing until it reaches the maximum and then the next part starts. Yeah, interestingly also you see that here the stripes are wider than in the upper and lower area. The reason is in this part Antic steals cycles from the CPU to create the screen. Yeah, this is a blank area, there Antic does not need to do any DMA. And here Antic steals cycles, so CPU has less time available. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, what, el what other registers do we have? We have color play field 2. Let's see what happens if we change color play field 2. Okay, this is the same as the background, but in a high resolution mode, it's actually the background of the text screen. Interesting, you can also see it here already. The chroma of the text, in this case of the cursor, it is always the same as the one of the background. So GTIA is not able to create different colors or chromas at the high resolution mode because the frequency of the chip is simply too low. Okay, what other registers do we have? So in high resolution mode only one more is relevant and that's the foreground color. You can see it flickering here and again you see the chroma is blue and all we can change or all that is visible from the change is the change in the brightness. Okay, well, nice color palette, a total of nine color registers available depending on which graphics mode you choose. And yeah, I said there are hardware registers and shadow registers. I was talking about the hardware registers by now and when we look here we see there's a different meaning again for every read and every write. Yeah, when you look at the color registers, they can actually only be written to. There is no meaning for write, for read. And when we read it, we will get some arbitrary value. Yeah, either zero or FF. You can't use it. This is sometimes very cumbersome if you want to code, especially in higher level languages like BASIC. Um, and therefore Atari uh, traded the transistors in the custom chip with the transistors in the RAM. So what does it mean? If I just change this code again to what it was before, okay, write it to a loop, and we again write light red, and I start it, and you see the border is light red. Now I do the following, I put the loop here. So I change the value in the hardware register and the CPU loops. Yeah, and I start it again, I hope you can see it in the video. You can see it flashing shortly in light red and then it turns black again, just as if the chip had forgotten the value that we wrote in there. And in fact, something like this is really happening and because the hardware registers cannot be read back, Atari did the following in the vertical blank interrupt, which takes place every fifth of a second. They actually copy a dedicated register value from a RAM automatically to the hardware. That means here we have a corresponding part, which is called color 4. And this one is at the RAM location of page 2, 
where you will find this and even many other so-called shadow registers. The shadow register, as I mentioned, is copied to the hardware regi corresponding hardware register. This is the shadow of color background. So if I write the value there, keep my fingers crossed that I got the wrong right values. Okay, it works because now every start of a screen, this value is copied from the RAM location again into the ROM location, uh, into the hardware location. And what does that mean? It means that if I now increment this RAM location, we again cycle through the different colors of the palette. But as you can see, the change is not taking place mid-screen. Yeah, because the value is only copied over when the new screen, a new frame is starting, and therefore you the full frame always uses the same value. Yeah, again, this is a bit too fast, and what I can do is I can load the value from the frame counter and put it in there. And this is a very well-known effect. You see it cycling with the full frame rate to the complete palette. And you see that there are no mid-screen changes or flickering or something. And this is a very positive side effect of the shadow registers that even if you have a slow programming lang language like BASIC or and the same problem arises when actually when you have a very fast programming language like Assembler that if you change the register at the wrong place in time the user would see that you change it mid-screen although it's not intentional. Yeah, so Shadow registers help to keep the screen stable and they make it simpler for the programmer because I can actually just increment the value or read it back uh, the value that I wrote there before. Yeah, and uh, th from the color registers there are more. So we have color zero, which is at, we cannot see that one. Then we have color two. Ah, sorry, this is at 4, this is at 6, yeah, and I think you can meanwhile guess what happens. Yeah, this is the same color uh, shadow register, but for the background color of the text screen. Yeah, shadow registers have some more advantages. Um, for example, when also when reading data, this is something that might not be obvious at the in first place, but you have to be aware that with your uh, assembler code, you are incredibly fast on this machine. So what does it mean? If you read, for example, the value of a key, if you read the value of a joystick or a trigger, then because in real life, this trigger is a mechanical thing, if you push the trigger, it does not only transition from uh, from 1 to 0, but it bounces. Yeah. So technically when you press that button, the button will bounce. And that really means it goes from 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 many times until it finally reaches 0. And with Assembler, you are actually fast enough to detect all these intermediate states. And this is something that you don't want. Yeah. Because imagine you will have a you, you have your player and you want to jump and you press that jump button and while you are jumping uh, the system thinks that you release the button again and you press it again and yeah the whole control will go wrong and this is something where you have to be careful and where you should use the uh, shadow registers for the joystick for example um, typical examples where this does not work or where people did not stick to that rule uh, only work in the emulator because the emulator does not simulate the, the bouncing of a real joystick and then you sometimes get the effect that games that are very playable on the emulator become totally unplayable on the real machine. Okay, so enough for colors, hardware registers and shadow registers. And with the next part, we will go into Antic so I can show you more than just a simple text mode and some more colors also. Bye.